you, George. It's always a pleasure. Yeah. Uh, let's start off with your return to Ghana. First of all, welcome back to Ghana. Uh, how long have you been around and how has it been? Like Any changes so far? Um, I've just been on just over a week. Mm. Um, as soon as I agreed to leave Aston Villa, I decided to come here and have a few more days with the family and also equally have discussions with the FA. So I'm kind of like combining work with a bit of leisure. Mm. Uh, let's talk about the big one. Uh, your decision to leave Aston Villa's under-23 side. At what point did you make this decision? Well, we've been having conversations with uh, Aston Villa ever since we qualified with Ghana uh, for the World Cup. Um, the FA has been very professional, similar like how they did it before the qualification matches for the World Cup against Nigeria. I've always indicated to the FA that it's always Aston Villa that would dictate because they are my main priority. And uh, the FA acted really professional as usual um, with uh, requesting my, my services for the country. And uh, when they said that they would like me to stay on as the assistant coach uh, up until the World Cup, I was really, really honored and obliged uh, with the good news. Uh, however, Aston Villa would play a huge part in it. So the discussions have been going on since really March, I think, this year. Uh, but it, it intensified around June because as we were getting closer to uh, September uh, games uh, with Ghana, then the decision had to be made rather sooner than later. Mm. And uh, so it is a very recent one. I mean, at the point where you decided that you were no longer going to take this job again. How difficult was the decision at the point where you said, OK, I would have to choose Ghana? Very difficult because, you know, uh, as, a, as a player, I've played three seasons uh, for Aston Villa in the early 2000s where we had a fantastic team uh, playing in Europe, finishing fifth, I think, and eighth in the season. Um, so the Villa fans uh, are quite well respected in the sense that they know what, what, uh, what I've done for the club. Um, so coming back as a coach was also a big thing because some of the fans of Villa uh, still didn't forgive me <laughs> and nor forgotten that I left uh, to go to Middlesbrough as a player. So coming back to the club as a coach was really brilliant for me that the fans embraced my return. Um, having said that, I've spent three good seasons with the academy, starting as the under-18s assistant coach, then getting promoted to the under-21s, under-23s, currently under-21 squad, um, which was for me also another big promotion and a step closer to the real action, I would say. Um, so I've, I've learned a lot, and starting at Villa as a coach from three seasons ago to now, I can look back and say that I've improved a lot as a coach. Equally, I've learned also a lot. So the decision to, to step down wasn't easy at all. What would you describe as some of the highlights uh, during your coaching time at Aston Villa? Well, I think uh, for me, getting promoted to the under-23 squad was one of the big moments for me because um, after a season with the 18s, the club realised that I have potential as a coach. Um, as a coach, you always believe in yourself. You believe that you can do the job. However, you need recognition. And when that recognition came as, uh, as promotion to the under 23 squad, for me, it was a big thing. Um, that was really one of the highlights. But the, most, the one that stands out for me has to be, well, actually, there's two. <laughs> there's three, now that I'm thinking about it. Uh, uh, in the league, we, we played in the Papa John's Trophy last season uh, with the under-23s, uh, which is against League One oppositions. But we are under-23 squad of players of around 16, 17, 18 years old. Uh, I think the oldest I had at the time last season was 19. And uh, there were four games against the League One opposition. And we won three out of those, which was, for us, amazing. Because the season before, two seasons ago, the first game of the Papa John's Trophy away at Sunderland, we got beat 9-1, which was just you know, a shock to the system. And so a year later, if you look at how the players have developed and you've then managed to win three out of four games against the League One opposition, that's one of the biggest highlights for me mm. um, of my time at Aston Villa. Of course, uh, you know, winning the Youth Cup, um, the 18s coaches did that mainly. 
but the players that they had, 90% were all on the under 23 squad. So then they would go drop down an age group lower to perform for the FA Youth Cup. So I think as a whole PDP phase, everybody was really honored that the boys did it to, to win the uh, FA Youth Cup. Uh, now it's time for a really interesting question because when I was reading uh, the statement, I think one of the key takeaways was the fact that you mentioned that you want to now focus on the Black Stars job mm. ahead of the World Cup. There's been a lot of conversation on social media, but I just want to find out, was it a case that you had to choose between your Aston Villa job and the Black Stars? Yeah, well, people always speculate, isn't it? They, everybody would like to have their say. And, yeah. Uh, I have no issues with that, if I'm honest. I think uh, sports is amazing. It brings people together and everybody should and have a voice. Uh, so there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but I would like to say that it's not that I was forced to leave the job, but you have to respect the club as well. Uh, and the discussions was always between the club, what's the best thing for the club? What's the best thing for the coach, George Boateng? And what's the best thing overall moving forward also for what George wants to do. And George was adamant that he wants to really do the World Cup with Ghana. George wants and feels that it's the right decision to stay with Ghana and help. Uh, and then you, you come to a conclusion that both jobs are full time and both jobs demand a lot of time. And being the person that I am, uh, I, I don't like to lack in any department of what I do or what I undertake. So to be fully committed, uh, I have to make a decision. And when I looked at the overall picture, uh, uh, to me, it was the best decision for the club because when I'm away, every time on international duty, especially the World Cup, could be anything from three weeks to six weeks. And to be away from the role that I'm doing, the club said that it's almost impossible because I'll be missed. And it's not like you can replace somebody who knows the curriculum, who knows the program, and more importantly, who's been working with the players for the last three seasons. And then we both decided that it was best for me to then resign from one of my duties, which would be the Aston Villa one, and prolong my career with Ghana going forward. Well, that's a very good one that you talk about. Uh, you've now been about six months into the job as a Black Stars assistant coach. First off, uh, let me find out from you how the overall experience has been. A challenging one, mm. uh, definitely, but one that I, I really embraced. Um, I think you learn on the job, uh, even though you have a bit of experience in terms of coaching-wise, um, you still find that there are situations and uh, certain things, aspect of the coaching role that still comes as a surprise. So you have to adapt and you have to react and act quickly and try to be always a step ahead of what you think might happen. Um, but I've enjoyed it. Uh, and I think for me, uh, the pleasure so far has been, without a doubt, uh, we were not the favorites to, to beat Nigeria, to qualify. But if you look at the whole, um, the way we as a, as a technical staff, as the FA, and also as the group of players we had at the time, um, if you look at how everybody contributed, uh, for me, that's where the pleasure is. There's definitely nothing better than being able to say that I was part of that squad, that team that qualified Ghana for the World Cup. And it's the way we did it. If, if we were playing like a, a, a team that we, you know, we were heavenly favorites yeah. to win, and we did it. I don't think that everybody would react in the way that they have. But I think, truth be told, everybody had Nigeria as favourites. But as we all know, in football, that doesn't say anything. Yeah. You started answering this question by saying it was a bit challenging. Are there any particular challenges that you had to go through, especially comparing coaching a club side to a national side? Oh, of course. I mean, it's common sense, really, if you think about it. Um, a club level, you've got the group of players, the squad you've got, you are continuity, so you are constantly working with them on a daily basis to instill a program, to instill a formation, a system, uh, and a style of play. It's very, uh, it's, it's a lot easier because you can drill them on a daily basis. 
But with international level, you only get the players for a certain amount of days. And it's very, very challenging to get a group of players in that short of space to play the style and to understand the philosophy and to also know what their roles and responsibilities are. Very, very difficult. And that is challenging. And also, because you, have, you haven't got a, f a fully 26, 20, 25, 23 squad men that every week you are picking from, it makes it even more challenging because the pool of players that we have is huge. And every day you hear, oh, this one is now doing really well. You should have a look at him. Okay, I will. This one is doing great. Then all of a sudden, the ones that you've actually, that you are relying on, pick up an injury or have COVID or personal issues. So all these are quite challenging, but one that I think will make me personally a better coach eventually, because you learn on the job, you've got the experience, but can you also perform under pressure and adapt as quickly as you can? If you want to work at World Cup stage, World Cup level, these are the requirements. Well, speaking of your experiences so far, uh, you're part of the team that went to Japan for the 2022 Korean Cup. A bit of mixed feelings there, losing 4-0 to Japan and then showing resilience against Chile despite being two men down, uh, still managing to you know, pull a draw in normal time and then finish as third place after winning on penalties. What would you say were some of the key learnings from the Korean Cup? Well, I have to say that we talked about challenges, right, earlier. And before we went to Japan, we had lots of challenges as, as coaching staff, but also as a team and as management. And the FA had challenging uh, situations. We, we did not encounter COVID issues, uh, which can happen any day. So we also had personal issues from players in terms of family or issues. And we also had players who were close to signing for a new team, which also had to travel away from Japan. So it wasn't easy. Uh, and then putting a squad together to be able to travel to Japan to play those games was quite uh, difficult. But once we got there, I thought it was really good. And these kind of friendly games, of course, nobody wants to lose any game. But we as a staff saw the games more as very usable to see who is capable to perform for us in September and the World Cup and beyond that. So every game we play, whether it's a friendly, whether it's a tournament or whether it's, a, it's a, an AFCON game, the players know, they are well aware that they are basically showing their abilities. And every game will, will, will prove that, oh, okay, he succeeded, so he's good enough for us to, to take him to go forward. A good example would be uh, Ali Duseidu. Yeah. I think prior to the Japan trip, uh, nobody in Ghana would have said to us or would have said to himself or herself that Ali Duseidu is well capable enough to play at, at uh, World Cup level or at AFCON level. And when we, when we watched the game back, we were very impressed. Yes, he picked up a red card, but even that is also part of education. It's a learning process for the player and for everybody else because we... We talked about still having the composure and the calmness, even though you are under stress. Uh, when we get to the World Cup, we would need everybody to stay on the pitch and not pick up unnecessary yellow cards, unnecessary red cards, because it will end up costing you games. But his performance as a player was outstanding. So we've gained something in just one game where we've, we've gained a very, very good player. The game against Japan that we lost 4-0, uh, people probably think that, yeah, but why you guys always talk about the games you won or yeah. the games you did well? The thing is, when you lose like that, you actually learn more about the group than when you win 4-0. So, again, we look at the resilience of the team, who still kept going, who still played in their role and responsibilities and made the right decisions when it was required. And if you look at it, we've got a South American team in the group against uh, Uruguay. Mm. So playing uh, in games like that 
and we've got South Korea. So when we went to Asia to play against Japan, uh, it gives us an idea of what we are going to expect when we play South Korea, or is it called Republic Korea, sorry. And then when you play, we played against Chile equally, it will give us an idea, right, when we're playing against Uruguay. Mm -hmm. So these type of friendly games are really good for the coaches, but also for the players to get an idea of what to expect once we get to the World Cup. Well, speaking of what to expect, uh, based on your experiences from the Korean Cup, which you think mirrored what to really look forward to in our group games, how ready do you think the team is and what has to be done from now up until November? I think um, I talked about style of play, responsibilities on the pitch, and the philosophy of what we want to try and do and achieve. I think everybody saw a glimpse of it against Nigeria, where we build up from the back, sometimes with three. And we, we all could see that the goalkeeper is really important in that role, plays a big role in playing out from the back. And we also could see that we were trying to play through midfield uh, with combinations, rotations from midfielders, trying to get our six on the ball if it's possible. If not, can we use the spaces on the wide areas? depending on where the opposition is giving us the freedom to do so. So if you look at that, if you ask me how well or are we, is the team ready for the World Cup, I would like to say it's always progressing because you're not sure yet who you're going to have available, right? But the most important thing is that everyone that has been in camp with us so far is getting the idea of, okay, this is how we play out from the back. This is how we play through midfield. And this is how we finish the attack in the final third, either through crosses, combination play, or forward runs. So the idea is gradually progressing. And hopefully, when we get to November, hopefully, the group that we will have will definitely understand what we are looking for and what the requirements are. Because they are very, very good players. Mm. Uh, just to try 